Hello, and welcome to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm very happy to have you here with me today. We have a special show today. I am here with Representative Linda Ichiyama from our State House of Representatives. She's also on the, the Women's Legislative Caucus, or I should say in the Women's Legislative Caucus. Linda, I'd like to thank you so much for coming. Welcome thank to the you. show. Thank you so much for having me. Oh, goodness, yes. I mean, shoot, you do so much. You're on uh, three or four committees. I know you're on the, I got to write it, I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget, uh, the Protection and Commerce Committee, the Committee of Economic Development, and the one on Labor and Public Employment, right? So these are all of the things that you do. Are you on more than that, or did I, I think you are more than Just that. Just those three. It is those three. Just those three. That's a lot. There's a huge amount of stuff. What um, sort of prompted you to be in the politics anyway and become a representative? Actually, I was interested in policymaking from a very young age. Uh, in high school, when I was a senior at Mauna Loa, I was a student member on the Board of Education. And oh. so I represented hundreds of thousands of public school students on the board and oh. was the student voice on uh, all types of issues, ranging from school uniforms to vending machines to local school boards. And nice. uh, so I guess you could say I got bitten by the bug early. <laughs> and then I went to school in Washington, D.C. I worked on the Hill for then Congressman Abercrombie. Oh, wow. I came back home for law school and interned at the state legislature. And I thought that I would practice law for a little while and then maybe one day later on run for office. Um, but it turned out that in my last year of law school, my senator ran for lieutenant governor and my rep ran for his seat. Oh. So it was an open seat in my home district. Right, and that's your home district. I was going to say that. It's District 32, right? And so it used to be a different number for a while, right, from 2010 to 2012 or something. And then right. it became, so you've actually been there since 2010, though, right? Right. Okay. I was first elected in 2010. And so in 2012, we have reapportionment. We do that oh, every 10 okay. years because that's based on the census. So the next one is coming up really soon in 2022. That'll be the next reapportionment. Uh, so it was District 31, and now it's District 32. Is it the same district? So, I mean, the same um, cities and, and uh, neighborhoods and things in the district? Or did um, they add something or take it away, or is it basically the same? Basically, it's the same. They added a few streets in Aliamanu and took away a few streets in the gardens. But we have a pretty stable population. I also have a very high-density district because I have a lot of condominiums in Salt Lake. Right. So the lines didn't shift that much. Uh, actually, I was, I was very fortunate in that sense. Right. Absolutely. Now, so do you deal with um, just the labor and the economic the stuff of your district, or does that um, sort of constitute to the whole island? Uh, statewide. All, statewide. So all the islands, even. Right, right. Oh, so, so there's like a representative from each island that's going to be on that committee? No. Is that the way it works? Um, unfortunately, we can't do it that way because then we would have to have everybody on every committee. Oh, right. So what we do is uh, we divide it up between committees, and we try to have representation from both neighbor islands and Oahu, as well as male, female, and minority, uh, majority uh, representation. Okay. And then we uh, debate the issues in the committee, then it moves to the full body for a vote. And usually a bill gets referred to several committees, so you'll have mm -hmm. several times to hear the testimony and uh, make amendments as the bill moves along. And then if the bill moves to the final vote, then it passes out of the House, moves to the Senate, same process. About how long does it take for, for that process to happen? Is it always different, or is there pretty much of a set Gosh, one? it varies from bill to bill, and it just okay. depends. Some bills will move through real quick. Mm -hmm. Others, it may take uh, multiple sessions, multiple years. It right. just really varies. But we have 60 legislative working days, and we're in session from January through May. Right. That's a long time. It feels like a long time, but it goes by so fast. Right? It's kind of like these shows. We think at first when we start, it's like, oh, my gosh, what? A half an hour. And then the half hour is up, and you're going, what? Where'd it go? Right. right. You <laughs> blink, and it's gone. Right. You blink, and it's gone. That's exactly right. So we're in the, um, the Women's Legislative Caucus now, and it's been around for 20-some-odd years, right? More than oh, 20 years? I would say over 30 years. We over 30 years. Early 1980s. Wow. Yes, it was co-founded by Senator Maisie Hirono and some of her colleagues. Right. And I was fortunate. I was talking to her recently, and she was telling me the story of how the caucus got started. And she said that when they first brought up the idea, the male colleagues and legislators said, oh, no, you don't need a caucus. Why don't you just put in your bills like everybody else? And so she 
and you know, kind of smiled as she was telling the story, and she tightened her women's resistance scarf, and she said, you know, but we did it anyway. All right. And thankfully they did, because here we are 30 years later, still right, going. still going. I know that she was going to be um, the keynote speaker at the um, Women's Legislative Breakfast. I think we have a picture of the Women's Legislative Breakfast here, don't we? I think, maybe, to show. Hmm? Maybe not. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Um, I know she was um, slated to be the keynote speaker and then had to rush back to Washington for Unfortunately, the important votes, which right. I understand. That was actually the week when they were able to break the deadlock for the right. federal shutdown. So right. unfortunately, she couldn't be with us, but right. we had her chief of staff there to accept on her behalf. Right. I have uh, put together a little proposal for her that I'm hoping she will come on um, as part of this series, because I'm going to do a whole series during this um, section of the session while you guys are bringing forth the Women's Legislative Caucus package, the mm. bill package that you Great. guys put together. And so I'm uh, saying a little prayer that that she will come on my show as, as one of the founders, which I think would be really amazing. Patsy love, Minks was involved in that too also, yes, wasn't she? Yes, In the founding I'd um, love stages. to see that episode, and I'd love for it to be recorded for everybody to see for history. Well, so much it, it will history, be. Because we preserved. are recorded. We're live right now, but we're also going to come out on the YouTube um, mm -hmm. channel afterwards. They will post our, um, we have a YouTube channel, and so all of our shows get um, uploaded to the YouTube channel. So Perfect. it would be um, preserved know, for preserved future for generations. Posterity. Yes. yes, thank you very much. That's where I was going with that. You know, I have a quote from uh, Representative Cynthia Thielen, who was also um, involved in the beginnings of yes. the Women's Caucus. Um, not in the very first years, but close. She was in there. And I love what she said. Different decades of women banding together can make a powerful sisterhood, which will make our communities, state, and world a safer and better place, which I think is just so true. Women need to come together. We need to, and, and I, I love all the, the women that are coming into uh, politics right now and all the women that, that were actually elected in the midterms that, you know, to, to see the balance in Washington change from just this all white male to the, and, and at watching the, um, the state of the union the other night, I saw, if you look at the Republican side, it's pretty much all white male. <laughs> and then you look at the Democrat side and it's just this wonderful blend of diversity, you know, of gender and race. And I, it was just, it was wonderful to well, see. I like to tell people we're the party of the big tent. Right? So <laughs> like we that. accept everybody. And I yes. think that really speaks to who we are as Democrats. And, and as who we are as Americans, right? Because that's what we're supposed to be all about, in my mind anyway, is accepting all of, um, all of it right. um, within the bounds because you have, it's like you can accept all of it, but you have to do it within the bounds of society mm -hmm. so that you make sure that people are safer and not just sort of walking over everyone because that's the way it's supposed to be. Sure. So it's a hard balance, I think, for politicians to, to find, right? I think it's a hard balance for all of us to find, right? right? Uh, how do we integrate but still preserve our own customs and cultures and right. uniqueness? Yes. That's always hard. Thank you. That's exactly what I was trying to say, but could not quite figure out the right words. And that was perfect. Yeah, that's exactly what I meant. Yes. <laughs> you know, um, I saw something on your website that talked about um, trying to restore the public trust, that we can trust our politicians and that we can... Um, you know, trust our leaders to, to lead us the right way and to, to really represent what we want. And, and I think that's a really um, noble and admirable thing that is your goal to try to do. And I, I thank you for that because we need more, rep more representatives you. and more politicians like you. Oh, thank so. you. I think it's something that my colleagues and I all strive to do every day. And I think one of the best things about being in the House of Representatives, so we represent pretty much one of the smallest political units in the state. So we are really close to our constituents. And I see them every day when I walk my kids. I see them when I go to Longs. And yeah. so I, I see their families growing up when I go to school events. And right. it's something that I so much value about being in this particular office. And so I think it's having people who are 
connected and visible in their communities that's going to hopefully restore that trust. Because when you know right. somebody, when you see them every day and you can talk to them about your concerns and they're sure. accessible, I think that's where you get better transparency and better accountability. Right. Gosh, that's so true, too. That's exactly what I think we need in is that boots on the ground kind of right. reach out to the people and shake their hands, you know, not just not just shake their hands as you're walking by and get a photo op, but shake their hands and talk to them, like you said, mm -hmm. and find out what their concerns are. Find out what they're thinking about. What what are the problems that they face each day? You know, our cost of living is so high here in Hawaii, and that is puts on a, such a struggle and a stress, I think, on people. And... I think part of that economic stress or financial stress really works on people and leads to some of the domestic violence that we see. Um, you know, who can you take it out on? You take it out on the person that's closest to you. Mm -hmm. So if we can keep the narrative going, that we can talk about it, that um, we can get rid of that shame blanket that sort of um, goes over the top of everyone so they feel like they can't say anything because people will judge them or they will think badly of their family or any of those things. And I think once we can, even, and it's just talking about it over yes. and over and over and being able to verbalize what that means. Right. And, and then men and women too, because women are abusers also, but then they can have that outlet. They don't have to, it doesn't have to be under that blanket of secrecy and shame. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the biggest things. And I know that this bill package is really amazing. There's some amazing bills in here. Um, we just have a minute until we go to break, though. So we'll start talking about this, um, this package when we come back because there's a lot of amazing bills in here that are set up to help people, help women that have been victims, um, to help women's health issues. And so there's all kinds of really important things that I want everyone to hear. So please come back. Do not go away. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Sinclair. We'll be right back. Hey, aloha. My name is Andrew Lanning. I'm the host of Security Matters Hawaii, airing every Wednesday here on Think Tech Hawaii, live from the studios. I'll bring you guests. I'll bring you information about the things in security that matter to keeping you safe, your coworkers safe, your family safe, to keep our community safe. Uh, we want to teach you about those things in our industry that, you know, may be a little outside of your experience. So please join me because security matters. Aloha. Aloha, I'm Dave Stevens, host of the Cyber Underground. This is where we discuss everything that relates to computers that's just kind of scare you out of your mind. So come join us every week here on thinktechhawaii.com, 1 p.m. on Friday afternoons. And then you can go see all our episodes on YouTube. Just look up the Cyber Underground on YouTube. All our shows will show up and please follow us. We're always giving you current, relevant information to protect you, keeping you safe. Aloha. Hello, welcome back to Finding Respect in the Chaos. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair and I am here with Representative Linda Ichiyama and we are talking about the bills that are going through the session right now that came out of the Women's Legislative Caucus. But as you were just saying, Linda, tell me there's more bills than just these? Yes. That is interesting. I want to hear. It's actually a, a, a surprising circumstance that in, as long as I've been in office, we haven't really come across before. Um, but I think it's a good trend. Our caucus package is limited to 10 bills. And so we have to prioritize amongst many, many measures uh, sure. which ones can be in the package or not. But we actually had a conversation this year where so many other people wanted to introduce pro-women, pro-family bills. And they said, you know what? We know you have a limit, so we're going to have somebody else introduce the bill because that way it's still discussed and heard. Oh. And it leaves more room for other bills to make it into the uh, caucus package. Okay. And so, for example, we have an equal pay bill that is a follow-up to last year's bill, which okay. uh, would prohibit people from... Uh, inquiring prospective employers from inquiring about a uh, prospective hire, hiree's salary. So you cannot ask what was your past salary at your past jobs. Because oh. unfortunately what we're finding out is that the, the pay gap follows a woman from job to job to job. Oh, right. right? She sure. got paid less at her last job. She will get oh. paid less at future jobs. Oh, and it's sure. self-perpetuating. 
So there is a bill to follow up on that bill from last year to kind of clarify and help expand that protection for women. Mm -hmm. And that was actually introduced by both the labor chairs, uh, Representative Johansson and Senator Tony Gucci. And nice. so another example is a bill to um, provide uh, people who take care of uh, children or dependents to provide them with a tax credit so that it can help them financially because we know so often people have to take time off of work oh, yeah. or make financial sacrifices mm -hmm. to take care of a loved one and so right. that actually came through uh, the Kiki Caucus package. Oh nice! So it was actually a really exciting thing for me to see this year right. that so many people want to do these bills that we're able to put even more into the Women's Caucus package. Oh. That's so great because that's what we need. We need everybody to get on board, right? Yes. Which is why I'm always saying, you guys, it's important to be involved, stay involved. Now, if somebody wanted to come to the legislation, I mean, legislator, yeah, to one of the sessions, <laughs> I always uh, get mumbled up with that word, um, but they wanted to come to the session and they wanted to speak on one of these bills. How would they know when it's going to be there? How would they know when to show up, how to behave, who do they talk to, all those things. How does someone go about doing that? That's a great question. A great resource and the best place to start is the Capitol website, which is okay. capital.hawaii.gov. C-A-P-I-T-O-L dot Hawaii okay. spelled out dot gov. And on the Capitol website, you can search bills by keywords. So if you're interested in education, if you're interested in, for example, women's health, you can type in those keywords and a number of bills will pop up. Then you can see the bill status. When is it coming up for hearing? Okay. When can I uh, submit testimony? Another good resource is the public access room on the fourth floor of the Capitol. They have people there who are very friendly and nice who want to help people get involved in the legislative process. They'll okay. help explain how to use the website, how to read a hearing notice, how to okay. track a bill online, and they're a really great resource. So that was called what again now? The Public Access Room. Public Access Room. Okay, everybody, you heard that. If you are wondering how to get involved, go to the website, the capital.hawaii.gov. And um, then if you want to in person, go down to the Capitol, go to the fourth floor to the Public Access Room, and those people will be glad to help you. The Public Access Room also has a website. And there's uh -oh. a link on the Capitol website to the oh, public okay. access room. And so on their website, they have a lot of resources, templates, uh, okay. guidelines that will be helpful for anybody who's uh, maybe just learning about the legislature. Right, which is kind of like all of us, right? I think, I think there's this new resurgence of interest and involvement from people, right, nowadays, um, just within this last sort of since the last election. The, Last since 2016. So in the last couple of years, we've really had a lot of people just wanting to get involved now. And I think that's the best thing to come out of everything that's happening in Washington. I think is, so too, is that people are saying, I need to get involved. Yeah. It's time for me to make my voice be heard. And I yeah. think that's, that's actually really been really fantastic. I know every time I get too depressed, or I, not depressed exactly, but I get too sort of bogged down and down discouraged. about what's it, discouraged. Thank you. That's the word I was looking for. Um, I, and I do, it's hard not to get discouraged with everything that's happening in, in Washington. Who do you listen to? Who do you believe? Who, who's telling you the truth? You know, there's all these different things coming at you that make it difficult. So, I think for me anyway, what I do is I come back away from all that. Mm -hmm. And I and I just look at what's happening right here. What's in front of my face? What's happening where I live? And what can I do about that? And I think then I feel like I have some power. Mm -hmm. I feel so disempowered when I think about all that's happening out there. But when I bring it back to where I live and the people around me in my neighborhood or on my island, you know, then I... I I don't feel so discouraged. Then I feel more empowered and I feel sort of like I want to go out and do something. It's sort of, you know, and I like that feeling. And I'm hoping that translates to other people too. I think so. I think so. And I think the, the state legislature is a good way for somebody who's just learning about the political process to get involved because exactly that. The, the bills that we consider are going to affect you, your family, your neighbors, someone you know. Mm -hmm. And I think having that personal perspective one, makes your testimony more relevant, right? right? But two, makes the issue so much more real, 
for people who live here. And I, I think that's a great incentive for people to get involved. I agree. I absolutely agree. And some of these local bills that we have in from the Women's Legislative Caucus, we had talked a little, I had Senator Laura Thielen on, and I'm going to make this a whole series, actually. I'm going to have, I'm going to try anyway, have every single one of you guys on before the, the whole session is over so that um, I can sort of get everyone's input on, on all of these bills and, and give you guys a chance to tell people out there what you would like them to hear and, and what you would like them to maybe go out and do. Um, and so I think that's important. For me, there's one about the statute of limitations. And I, I think if you know, if you've seen my show before, <laughs> you've heard me say this before, but it's so important and I want people to understand how much it changed my life. Um, I was one of that, as I was telling you just before the show started, um, I was involved in one of the very first um, delayed discovery suits coming in a civil case against my father um, for my childhood abuse. I didn't remember it till I was 30. And I thought I had, you know, the statute of limitations is gone and I thought I had no recourse. And then when I found out that I might be able to have that recourse and I took him to court and I, he had to stand accountable. And, and we won. Um, we were awarded, you know, a, a, a monetary judgment. <clears throat> that was one of the most empowering feelings I have ever had in my life. And I thought, you know, he had to stand accountable. It put the blame and the shame, <clears throat> excuse me, on him, mm -hmm. right, instead of on me. And I had been walking around with it, carrying that shame and that blame and that secrecy. And when I broke that secrecy, and I put the blame where it belonged and the shame where it belonged. I didn't have it anymore. <clears throat> it changed my life. And that's why I know that this is such an important bill. And I am just praying that it will go through because I want everyone else that's out there that's had, you know, the same kind of circumstances know that they have recourse. They don't have to live in shame. Absolutely. Right? Absolutely. So this bill is actually a follow-up of, of a bill we passed last year. And that bill last year actually re-extended the window for survivors of ch childhood sexual abuse to file a civil claim, even if the statute of limitations had passed. And so it reopened that window until 2020. And so now today, a person whose claim may have expired now has a new window, a new opportunity to bring that case and to hopefully begin to experience right. some of that healing and, and justice that they so rightly deserve. Right. So this uh, legislation for this year would extend the amount of time for a person to bring a civil uh, suit past a certain amount of years. Right now, it's just a, too short of a window. It's just two years, right? It's two years, um, but it depends upon uh, <coughs> when the person me. reaches uh, the age of 18. And so it's calculated right. from that date or the date of discovery. And we just want to give more people more time. We know that there is so much trauma involved Right. that it takes a survivor so much to be ready to be at that point where they say, you know, I want to seek justice in our civil courts. Right. And to have the courage to come forward and do that is tremendous. It is tremendous. It takes a lot and it is scary. And I'll go along with that. But if you can have some support around you, it's worth every second. Because mm -hmm. when you walk out of that courtroom and you know <clears throat> that you have prevailed, it's just, you're, it's an amazing feeling. It's, it's so empowering. And I think it was the thing that um, allowed me to get as much progress as I have in the healing mm -hmm. years. <clears throat> Excuse me, I don't know. I all of a sudden swallowed a frog. <clears throat> Sorry. <laughs> but, <clears throat> so I want other people to have that same opportunity because it's so amazing. So there's a lot of other ones on here. There was one... Um, that <clears throat> didn't, here it is, <clears throat> it kind of goes along with, um, uh, for you being on the labor and economic development, this is uh, employment practices and, and all of that, so I thought that would be something that you might be able to speak to, this bill right here. 
Yes, so this <clears throat> bill was actually um, introduced by Representative Amy Caruso. She's one of our freshman representatives. Right, who might be on my show in a couple of weeks. Okay. Great. <laughs> so this year was the first year where we had an uh, incoming class of freshman representatives, 10, or the majority, six out of the 10 were women. Wow. And so hey. we feel really happy about that. Yeah. And uh, Rep Caruso's bill would prohibit uh, a non-disclosure agreement in cases involving sexual harassment or sexual assault because... So often, uh, people might get pressured, like you said, into silence or uh, into shame, and right. we do not, we do not want to allow a perpetrator to continue to uh, harass people because right. essentially that's what what ends up happening if nobody finds out. Sure. And so this would prohibit the practice of non-disclosure agreements. That was kind of like what we all heard about when. Um all the stuff started to break loose with the senators and the um, not involved in that non-disclosure agreement and stuff was also a um, cooling off period mm. where they weren't able to do anything for 90 days or I think it was 90 days that they had to do this cooling off period before they were able to even go forward with reporting it officially. Mm. Mm. And I, I know that they're trying to, on the, on the Hill, they're trying to get rid of that too. Um, and I can't remember her name. One of the senators was trying to bring forward a bill to do the same sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And this and the Title Nine. Now Title Nine um, is mostly it started for sports, right? Um, That's what most people think of it as, right? right. But it's the same so much more than that, girls' right? teams and boys' teams. But it yeah. is. It's a really powerful tool that I think people don't know about. Right. And that's why I love talking about it. Is that Title Nine is not just about athletics. It's about equal access to education. And what it says is that everybody has the opportunity to access education to be free of discrimination on the basis of sex. So this is not just protecting students, but also employees. Okay. So for example, it covers pregnancy discrimination against okay. uh, teachers. You cannot be subject to any type of discrimination because you are pregnant. Oh, and okay. so that's a huge protection. Uh, the Obama administration expanded a lot of the authority of the U.S. Department of Education under Title IX. And unfortunately, what we've seen with the new administration is a lot of rollbacks of those protections. And so right. last year, the legislature passed Act 110 to establish a state version of Title IX. Oh, so we are more protected even though the mainland and the federal yes. is something different. We have a state thing that, that exactly. protects Oh, so I like that. What happened was, for example, under the Obama administration, they were applying Title IX to uh, not just sex discrimination, but gender discrimination, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. Under Trump, that was rolled back and said, right. no, it's only going to be applied to sex. And so in our state law, which we passed last year, we made sure that those uh, categories would be protected so that, uh, for example, LGBTQ members of our community would be protected by those same anti-discrimination clauses. And what we're trying to figure out now, what the follow-up bill is for this year, is what's the best way to enforce that? Right. Should we look at a civil rights model? Should we look at, you know, is it the courts? Is it going to be administrative rules? What is the best way to facilitate that? And overlaying that as well is that the U.S. Department of Education has just rolled out new proposed rules which would roll back protections even, even more. further. Right. Right. And okay. so we want to make sure that the students and employees in our schools are going to have the same level of protections that they had previously and that everybody has the same access to education. Oh, my gosh. Okay, everybody. That, did you hear that? I hope so. And we need everyone to get involved with this and make sure that our state does not go down the road that, that everyone else is going down having the federal just roll everything back. Oh my gosh, I can't believe we're out of time already. Linda, thank, oh, thank you, you so much for pleasure. coming. It was really great to have you here. Everyone, I want to thank you for joining me for Finding Respect in the Chaos today. It's a great show and I hope that you'll join me next time. I'm Cynthia Lee Sinclair. This is Finding Respect in the Chaos. See you next time.